Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this season five of the Legends podcast with me, Sarah Faruya from Sarah Faruya Coaching. And I believe there are many ways to lead a life and everybody has stories and I want to tell them. And with this podcast, I'm amassing an archive of incredible stories from people showing a kind of snapshot in time and how how a life, the ebbs and flows of life can go. It's a brilliant companion piece to coaching. And today I'm so delighted to welcome Laura Cooper. Hi, Laura. Hello. (laughs) Laura and I met in Japan some years ago and we have our own story that we can tell later Um, but before we get into that Laura I want to ask the first question that I ask all my guests and that is tell me a story that's had an impact an influence or is just of interest. I think the story that has had the most impact on me actually is the reason I came to Japan. Mm. Um, one of the reasons I came to Japan while I was at university I was introduced to Angela Carter ah um, oh. yep Knights is, of the um, Circus yes Knights of the Circus yes um, what else have we got the Bloody Chamber the collection of fairy tales that she retold amazing um, now just fun fact sorry to interrupt you mm. but like I did my A-level English when I was 29 I think in 2000 and um, I've got an A, but <laughs> I was so happy, <laughs> like, ma- the mature <laughs> students. And um, we studied Nights at the Circus, Angela Carter. It's so wild. It's a wild mm. one. So s- go ahead. Yeah, so this, this whole Angela Carter connection kind of comes in and out of my life, really. I read all of her stuff when I was 18, 19. I pretty much got obsessed and mm-hmm. um, some of the things that she wrote about uh, included Japan. And she um, has a number of pieces of journalism that she wrote while she was living in Japan and a few short stories as well. There's a collection called Fireworks where she writes a few stories which are based on real events in her life. And I think that it was her writing about Japan that really got me interested mm-hmm. in it. And I think yeah it just kind of sparked this this long-term interest that eventually led to me going there and then as it turns out while I was working in Japan I had a co-worker who had taken over her job at NHK back in the early 70s this was 71 72 something wow. like that and then now actually she has the um connection at the university I'm studying at as well where she was a lecturer and she was working with Kazuo Ishiguro back in the, what was that, the 80s now, probably? Wow. Um, So, yeah, she's kind of like this reoccurring figure all the way through my life so far, anyway. Were you ever lucky enough to meet her? No, she died in the mid-90s. I can't remember the exact year. Okay. Um, So, no, never had that opportunity. What is it about Angela Carter's writing that, I mean, obviously there's that kind of recurring theme and that connection, but what is it about her writing and her storytelling that particularly piques you? I think the first collection I read was The Bloody Chamber, it was the short stories. And so it was all these retellings of fairy tales, which had a feminist mm-hmm. respin on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that appealed to me very much at the time. I don't think I'd ever read anything quite like that. And her prose as well is incredibly verbose and purple. And um, really, really just, I I don't think I'd read anything quite like it. And it was quite intoxicating at the time. Um, Yeah. Intoxicating verbal prose. Do you think that her writing influences your writing at all? Or is that just just simply a a love affair you have with that? No, I I went through this phase where I was reading Angela Carter and H.P. Lovecraft, who's a very, also a very purple horror writer. Yes. And so I think the two of them together actually had quite an influence on me, but not necessarily in what would be a good way nowadays, I think. I think two, maybe like a year and a half, two years ago, you could definitely see that more in my writing. And that's definitely been stripped away a little bit in the last year and a half, I think. Is that as you've um, really developed your own craft and become more into been studying? Yes, I think it's it's the studying and the the developing of your own voice. And I think also it is a response to the feedback that I've received from other people and what's considered more an acceptable voice or accept, acceptable style, I guess. Uh-huh. So, you know, 
it partly is marketing perhaps or trends oh. but yeah <laughs> interesting I'm going to come back to that because feedback is a horror story in itself isn't it and <laughs> And I'm sure in, in the last uh, year and a half since you've been doing your master's, it's something you have to have, isn't it, when you're doing a writing course like this? And I'm really interested to know how you develop the kind of humility to receive feedback and the confidence to receive, mm. receive feedback and how that's been. But I want to park that for now. Thank you. <laughs> and I can see you look so beautiful at the moment as well with this long flowing red hair and you've just got this gorgeous vibe going on at the moment. And um, perhaps we can talk about that as mm. well. So I would like to give you your rock star introduction now, Laura. So <laughs> Laura was brought up in Buckinghamshire and spent most of her adult life living in Japan where she juggled careers as an English lecturer, a music journalist and concert photographer. She has served on the board of directors of Few Japan, which is for empowering women in Japan, and circumnavigated the earth by ship, helping to foster grassroots cross-cultural communication with Peace Boat. Laura headed Fuji Rock Festival's English language magazine from 2016 to 2021 and is an award-winning portrait photographer. In 2020, she received a scholarship to study on the MA in Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia and is currently in her second year about to embark on her dissertation. Amazing. But she started writing poetry at the age of 11 during a school trip in northern France <laughs> while sitting in a World War I trench. Oh, golly, how very, very English A-level. <laughs> Oh, but by, by the way, my dad was into all of that. And we went to uh, the World War II war sites as well. Very sobering. And I, I actually won a project competition writing a project about that as well. So we've got some kind of inspiring stuff, isn't it? Really? It is inspiring very, um, stuff. Very potent. Yeah. yeah. What's what would we study two World War II poets at, in, at the GCSE? Mm. Can you remember their names? Yeah, what? it's probably Wilfred Sassoon. Owen, Siegfried Sassoon. Siegfried yeah. Sassoon and... Wilfred Owen. Wilfred Owen. There you go. Mm. There you go. I got Wilfred Sassoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good mix. <laughs> yeah. She studied English literature at the University of York, where she was the section editor of the Campus Arts magazine and also interviewed bands and photographers photographed for a gothic lifestyle magazine now I, I do want to come back to this kind of gothic you've definitely got the gothic vibes going on there it's never left <laughs> <laughs> I think that also um HP Lovecraft and uh Angela mm. Carter have got really gothic vibes about them as well as far as I was uh, concerned so she went on to into the book industry first as a bookseller and then as a book buyer for a change of sci-fi fantasy shocks in the London and it's so sucked that she quit and became an English teacher in 2005 <laughs> bravo and in 2006 she moved to Japan where she worked in a Eikaiwa which is an English school where you do one-to-one -one, uh, teaching with with people who want to learn English in Nagano which is the countryside here in a really big skiing place and Yokohama before the company went bankrupt and she went freelance after that. In April 2011, she embarked on the 73rd Peace Boat Global Voyage, which we'll talk about later, working on the ship as an English teacher for 80 days, circumnavigating the world. So she also started working for a Japanese music magazine as a photographer after a chance meeting on a Tokyo booze cruise and set up a music photography blog where she interviewed and photographed bands in the Tokyo music scene, the Mutekis, Feebat, and many others, including punk, rock, visual K, and metal bands. This led to being taken on by Smashing Magazine and eventually heading Fuji Rock Express. So um, many, many things to dig into here. I also uh, wanted to say here that Laura was the first photographer that I hired for my clients. Mm. So um, I do a one-year program and for the luxury package that people sign up to on my one-year program, I like people to get professional photographs done uh, because I think it helps people to build confidence, to be instructed, to collaborate with the photographer, to kind of humble themselves to the process and also just to have great 
profile photographs and lovely photographs. And Laura put a call out on Facebook saying, will anybody pay me for uh, portrait sessions? I really want to buy this piece of equipment. And so I will do these headshots. And I love a good ask like that. I love it. I love it when people can just ask for what they need and clearly tell you what they want. And that was when I got the light bulb above my head, which was, I'm going to hire her to photograph my one-year coaching clients. And so I booked Laura. I hope you got the piece of equipment. And uh, I think it was a lens. It was a, uh, it was a, a lens. camera lens, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you got a new camera lens. And then, of course, you then forged uh, great friendships and relationships with the people who you uh, you photographed as well and took some gorgeous headshots for my, uh, my beloved clients. Mm. So awesome. So it's just, it's <laughs> so interesting. I, I mean, this is why I love doing this podcast is just the variety of things that people do and the, and just the, the, incredible variety of stuff that people do and how many different ways there are to lead a life. But first, Laura, why don't you tell me about your background and your upbringing and uh, your uh, ancestry? (laughs) Well, um, where to start? So I grew up in Buckinghamshire in a little village. It's quite, I'd say, semi-rural. So lots of fields, lots of trees. Um, it's quite near Pinewood Studios. Oh, right. There were lots of cows in the field opposite, lots of baby mm. cows. That's a nice memory. So I, I think I spent a lot of my uh, childhood running around, running around the countryside, <laughs> which was quite nice. After all of that, I went to university in York, and I lived in York for four years. I moved to London. That's kind of all those things in a nutshell. Heritage wise is quite interesting, actually, although I was I was born in North London in Harrow and then um, grew up in Buckinghamshire, like from the age of one until I left home. But weirdly, having come to Norwich, my great grandmother was from Norwich. So it's in this weird way, I've come like all the way back home again. So that's the kind of short version. What attracted you to English? What kind of what kind of child were you? A quiet child or a kind of extroverted child, sporty child, bookish child? I mean, what kind of that I mean, those are real stereotypes there. For me, I know that I was just always I was always making up games in my head and then pulling everybody in to play the game. Like I can remember turning my bedroom into a into a spaceship and then getting everybody in. Why like, I was the captain of the spaceship, obviously. <laughs> like getting all my like <laughs> friends and like my brother and his friends in to kind of be in this spaceship with me or I was always starting clubs yes things like that so I'm the oldest of three Mm -hmm. and I think because of that I think I was quite good at entertaining myself yes because the other two were you know taking up the attention so I, I just got very good at always having like on a on a trip to the seaside for example I'd be the one with the Walkman and the book in a bag kind of amusing myself I remember going to the library quite a lot and like the just devouring series of books like Sweet Valley High and um, <laughs> all those other things. Point Horrors as well when I got a bit older. I was just always reading stuff. It just was the, the main way I entertained myself, I think. Mm. So then I think after the poetry thing came out of nowhere when I was about 11, mm. I then received quite a lot of encouragement to read more widely and to write um, from my teacher at my grammar school I went to. I remember, found out that I was reading all these little point horror novels and I think might have been a little horrified. So the next next day I come into school and she gives me a list of books, which um, we had like The Weird Stone of Brisingham by (gasps) Alan Garner. That's one of my favourites. And that's on set near where I live as well, where I was raised. Yeah. Oh, my God. I I think I reread that as an adult, actually. Yeah, I did as an adult as well. I read uh, The Owl Service as well. Uh, Yeah. Um, Yeah, Same author, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And who else was on that list? There was Cider with Rosie, Laurie Lee. Yeah. Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising, which is an amazing book. Oh, yeah, there were all sorts of things on there. And so I just worked my way through this list via the library. Mm-hmm. So she, she deserves quite a lot of credit for pointing me in a more literary direction, I think. Not that there's anything wrong with horror. I do love horror still. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you read somebody who loves horror. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you still read now? Of course, of course. Yes. 
Oh, I read everything, I feel. Um, mostly I read a lot of short stories because they're easy at yeah. the moment and do have a novel on the go at the moment. But I find actually a lot of the writing and the, the coursework that I have to do is kind of slowing me down quite a lot. But yes, I mean, I could show you my bookcase over here and there's like an entire shelf of things I have not yet read and it's getting bigger. <laughs> so. What are you reading at the moment? What am I reading at the moment? I have a book called Cold Enough for Snow, mm -hmm. which I just finished, actually set in Tokyo. And it's about a mother and daughter who come to Tokyo to just kind of wander the streets and talk about things. And it's got some family, some family stories. It's very quiet, very kind of measured prose. It's very, it, it, I dare say it's quite Japanese. In yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is it a Japanese author? No, um, but, it's, but whoever's written it has taken a, a Japanese stance on it somehow. Yes, well, she does have Asian heritage. I think her mother is from Hong Kong. It doesn't actually say in the bio, but um, so I don't know if that lends itself to that particular style. But the most interesting thing about that book for me is that there's no actual dialogue in it. It's all reported. And it's this, it definitely deserves another read. Because it's nice and short as well. It's only like 90 pages, so it's, it's good. But it's funny reading books which are set in Japan, having now left, because everything's like a bit heartbreaking. Oh, is <laughs> it? Yes, things. so many people say that who've left yeah. Japan. Yeah, so, you know, she goes to these department stores or, or like a little convenience store and she buys onigiri. And then it's like, I used to go to department <laughs> stores and buy onigiri. <laughs> yeah so I've been reading quite a lot of Japanese stuff since I left and I, it's it's equally like it's extremely pleasurable to be able to picture these things very clearly in your head but it also is really it can be quite saddening I guess it's a kind of evocative but also kind of viscerally felt somehow yeah it's a bit painful <laughs> oh yeah so um, many people who've left Japan like report that it I mean I have obviously have clients who've returned back to their home countries and so on and there's very few people who are like bye this is <laughs> like most people are really like they yeah yeah yes yeah. it's a really peculiar feeling and I don't know if it's experienced by people who've left other countries to the same extent I mean I guess it must be but I feel like Japan's a very particular place with a particular yes. effect on people and yes if you've been living there for as long as some of us have and then you leave it's really bizarre adjusting to life beyond that grief so, a little bit isn't it yeah i think so yeah, yeah. but so there's something more to it there's something really yeah yeah people tend to yearn and the, mm. i think also there's something quite unique about the the expat life in Japan, there's something quite democratic about it. Like I know all kinds of people mm, yeah. in the in the in the non-Japanese world. So you know, every I know all kinds of people, from people mm. who are heading up companies to people who are working in the family, like as uh, housewives or house husbands. So it's mm. it's interesting to to have and I don't know that like say Hong Kong or Singapore or some or Shanghai has that same kind of across the board like you get to know lots and lots of different people lots of different would you say what would you say like income brackets and things like that you just yeah all sorts of backgrounds and experiences yes. yes and I think also because the the foreign population in Tokyo is quite small yeah in comparison to other cities I guess you do tend to make those connections mm. because there are fewer people to kind of ghettoize yourself from interesting and you know people tend to hang out at the same places the same bars or the same i'm, I'm just gonna go bars <laughs> more bars, <than> bars. <laughs> bars, <or> bars. <laughs> <laughs> live houses yeah. and bars yes <laughs> so yeah i think it's a it's a real melting pot but it's a tiny melting pot isn't it mm, a tiny melting pot yeah it is a tiny melting pot yeah really interesting and i think i was in a choir so again you get to meet people from all parts of Japanese society and from the, you know, expat, expat community as well. Didn't your choir do Carmina Burana? Yeah, I sang in yes. that. Yes. 
Yeah. I sang in that, like, that was the last time I sang with that choir, actually. And in fact, I came back for it. I'd left Mm. because they were doing a really, really hard Bach piece, one of Bach's fugues. And I was like, no, (laughs) it's too (laughs) hard for me. I know my limits. And then they were like, we're doing Carmina Burana. And I was like, can I come back? And I had to (laughs) re-audition and go back. Oh, that was just the most incredible feeling. The most incredible. It was beyond, you know, like when you feel like you're cosmically connected to the universe somehow mm. sing when when you're singing I don't know how you get that maybe it's from listening to music or reading a great book but it was just like pff, I was on another level I can imagine seeing that where did you perform that that must have been quite powerful must not it yeah I don't well I was in the choir so I don't know what it's like to see <laughs> <it live. laughs> but my, my friends who came to see it reported that it was very good <laughs> And they're very kind as well. But it, for, that, for that as well, we didn't have an orchestra, a full orchestra. We had just timpani. And so mm. it's those massive kettle drums, you know, yeah. and oh, my God, I've got goosebumps now thinking about it. It was, it was just such a terrific experience to mm. sing that. Yeah. It's so spooky. Mm. It is, isn't it? Really? I think it's a, drunk, it's a drunken monk song or something, isn't it? Yeah. I heard that somewhere. Yeah. Drunk monks singing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. What kind of music were you listening to then back when you were a teenager doing your GCSEs and A-levels? Punk, rock, Mm -hmm. heavy metal. Yeah. And and classical music as well, weirdly. Bands. So this was the 90s. So it would have been things like Machine Head and Fear Factory Mm -hmm. and the Smashing Pumpkins and Guns N' Roses and Metallica and Megadeth and Iron Maiden and blah, 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 Offspring, Green Day, and on and on and on. So it was kind of, I guess, the more accessible end of metal yes. and, and rock. And sort of um, at that time, I guess that genre was a bit more in the ascendant and a bit more popular. That was early 90s, I guess. By yeah. the end of the 90s, it had all gone a bit new metal and was starting to kind of fade off a little bit. Not that it ever went anywhere. I just didn't get much attention. Yeah. So, but I weirdly was, oh, I say weirdly, not weirdly for me. Um, I was also listening to classical music uh, because it helped me study. I can't, and I still can't today, actually. I cannot study with anything that has words. Same. Um, so it has to be classical or jazz or something like ambient. Yeah, same, same. In fact, I find it hard to listen to any music with words ever. Oh, ever. Really? And I never listen to any new music these days, really. It has mm. to be really good or mm. um, or nostalgic for me to be remotely interested. Strangely, yeah. I don't know how that came about because I love ambient music yeah. and so on. <laughs> yeah, cool. So you went to, so it sounds like this English teacher had quite a big influence on you. Mm, mm, Is there, yes. Can we get, do a shout out? <laughs> shout out to mm. Kathy Davies, who Aww. was my uh, high school English teacher. And she really got me into writing and sort of encouraged me to write poetry and the occasional bit of short story and then was entering my <laughs> entering my writing into competitions which I then started winning so that was I mean she I think she was my biggest motivator really sort of encouraging giving me feedback entering these things off into competitions for me and yeah just helped kind of instill a love of writing and a love of literature in me and I and also I really enjoyed her English classes she had a very how would I describe the way she taught like I can't really describe it (laughs) it was just one of those it was one of those rooms that you would come into and I would just feel like okay it was like a little safe space I guess although she did once tell me to take all my earrings out because I had too many in No, it wasn't that safe. (laughs) You should just do it a job, I suppose. But uh, yeah. Um, Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? There's, I think oftentimes the English teachers are kind of frustrated artists themselves. So those those of us who were a bit unusual, who, you know, hung out at the edges of things were often felt quite well taken care of by our English teachers. It's almost Mm -hmm. cliche. Uh, me too <laughs> Mr Lally and Miss Strange yeah <laughs> yeah Miss Strange that's a good name yeah, yeah. Her, her, her brother was a priest 
Father Strange, and he did my <gasps> grandma's funeral, which is lovely. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think it's lovely. <laughs> Father Mitchell. Strange. Yeah. I'm going to oh. use that in a future book. Oh, please do. <laughs> Yeah. Father Strange, yeah, amazing. So you went to English uh, to study English at York University. Mm. And what was your university time like? I was a um, naughty university student. I wasn't super naughty. <laughs> I, I actually, I, in hindsight, I think I was too young. I think I was too immature when I went to university. Interesting. And I think I would have benefited from being slightly older. But on the other hand. I still have wonderful friends from that time and wonderful memories. And I don't think I would change it too much. But I, I had the chance to do some, a little bit of photography. I was working on the, the, the arts magazine. I started working for that little goth mag. So it was all, um, you know, all these things back then that still kind of resonate now don't yeah you? it's like there's a golden thread running through everything isn't it yeah and I think I mean the, the course itself I think my, my most enjoy, I've got two enduring memories of studying English there and one of them was studying Anglo-Saxon and the other one is um this course on women and myths so it was like feminist retellings of um fairy tales and myth- mythology mm. and I think those two are the ones that have always stuck with me as you know the most memorable experiences yeah the women of myth was just you know you've kind of always sort of seen things in one particular way and then you branch out and see this new feminist interpretation on the way things are being told the way these stories are told I'm like oh I didn't realize there's an alternate way of looking at things so that was you know very enlightening Anglo-Saxon was incredibly difficult and I didn't really ever get the hang of it um, because I didn't understand language and how language worked. But I was still expected to translate these passages of Anglo-Saxon in my final exams. But the poetry and the, the literature and our tutor, who was uh, a guy called Sid Bradley, took us on these, this wonderful trip up to Northumberland where we were running around Anglo-Saxon sites and going to Durham Cathedral and we went to Lindisfarne. And, yeah, it was just a very good memory of, of something that was actually incredibly difficult so sounds a little yeah. bit magical I love it all was. That. yeah 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 I, my favorite thing about Linda's farm was actually getting to stay on the island because the tide comes in and you can't get off the island so you just have to wait until the next day when the tide's got out um, but they have these big fat eider ducks on there and they're so squidgy yeah. and yummy <laughs> um and I, I've never forgotten them <laughs> they were great <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. I, I love that you said like, oh, I didn't know there was different ways to do things. And that's the whole backbone of this podcast, this mm. of these conversations that I'm having with people is to marry together the coaching with stories so mm. that it's really, you know, there are different ways to do things. And we'll come on to the way that you kind of super innovated your life in the last two years as well. But I also think if there's a real self-awareness to saying I was too young, then I was mm. too young. Um, were you 18 when you went to university? Yeah, I have this. I don't even know if this is true anymore. In um, oh, my God, you're such a great coaching client. I'm not even sure it's true. <laughs> so go on then. No, it was a long time ago. I have a memory of, of wanting to, to, like, delay going to university, but I don't know if I ever voiced it uh-huh. um, or not. And I, I seem to th- think in hindsight I kind of knew at that time that maybe I didn't want to go straight away and also I think I wanted to go traveling and yeah but I did that later obviously (laughs) but yeah it's you know where I work currently I'm working with quite a lot of young people some of whom are about to graduate from high school and a couple of them are like I don't know what to do with my life I don't know if I want to go to university I don't know what job I want blah 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 and I can't just kind of say to them you are You've got so much time. Yeah. Take a year off, take two, figure something out, and you know, you'll hopefully make a, a good decision at some point. But you don't have to meet the expectations that people have on you or that you have on yourself, I think. Um, you can kind of take some time out and do something for yourself that will hopefully point you in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a 
a really great insight to have there. It's funny, isn't it? When you're 18 or 19, it just feels, and, and you're from a certain kind of background, it feels desperately imminent that you need to get out to university. But I can mm. remember saying that I wanted to do a gap year and being told that I was a financial millstone around my parents' neck and they wanted me to get through as quickly as possible. Yes. Thanks, Dad. Well, can you think and, about that whole conveyor belt when we were, when we were younger, yeah. like you go to university or you don't or you get a job. Then you get married and you have kids and you have the mortgage and blah, 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 and that whole like conveyor belt of life. And I remember thinking, oh, you know, by the time I'm 25, I'll have a house and a husband and maybe a child. Actually, the child, I think, might just not have, might have just been like a cat <laughs> or, or a chicken. But, you know, like I have, I remember having this idea of what my life would look like by the time I was 25. And then, of course, I got to 25 and none of that was true. And I'm glad it wasn't. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's really interesting. So I ended up going when I was 20 in the end because I just said, okay, mm. then fine, I'll, I'm going to take a year out, but I'm going to pay you rent so that mm. I'm not a financial millstone around your neck and I'm going to go and try and improve my grades and I'm going to hang out and become a subversive <laughs> and really annoy you <laughs> and then go to <laughs> university when I want to. So I ended up going to university when I was 20. You just mentioned Anglo-Saxon and the mm. women and myth. I wonder also, what's one book that really stood out to you from university? It's going to be Angela Carter. Okay, yeah. <laughs> We're going to go back to her again. I think, yeah, of all the books I read, it would be The Bloody Chamber. The Bloody um, Chamber. Because, yes, it has become my favourite book. I still reread it now. I do find the more I reread it, the more, the more purple I find that language. And sometimes I do find it a little bit impenetrable. But I persist because I love it and I, I just think it is it is that book that I just remember I remember having the sticky note on my wall with like Angela Carter the bloody chamber like note to self find it in the find it in the bookshop my copy I think I don't know if it's my original copy it might be is still with me but yeah so that's gone with me all around the world as well like I, that came to Japan with me <laughs> and now it's back in England as well so yeah. It's incredible how a, a good book that really resonates with somebody can take you so far. Yeah. And really ignite your philosophies and values in life as well somehow. Yeah, I think the sort of like awakening of things that happened in that, in that reading, just a, an alternate way of looking at stories and al an alternate way of, of thinking about the world that I'd grown up into that point. And yeah, also that way with language. I'd, I'd never read anything like that to that point. So it was all a mix of everything that I needed in one little slim book. So when you left university, you started working in the book industry as such. Well, actually, I started working in bookshops when I was about 16 or 17. And I worked in bookshops all the way through uni. Yeah. And then beyond that for a couple of years. and. Actually, book selling is great. I love book selling. I love hanging out in bookshops. I love just putting books on shelves or yeah. like reading them a little bit when no one else is looking. And because I was based quite close to London at one point doing that, I often got to go into London to go to like these little publisher dinners where you'd, you kind of get to meet the writers or the actors or whoever was publishing a book. You'd have these like nice evenings out meeting these people and discussing the books. It was great fun. And then somebody made a comment about how somebody in a company in London was looking for uh, somebody to take over their book buyer position. And I won't name the company, but I mean, from that description you mentioned earlier, you can probably figure it out if you know who they are. I ended up working for them. And so I was actually buying books and DVDs for them. Most of the DVDs were sort of anime, Japanese horror, science fiction, fantasy. Da, 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 da. So again, the Japan thing comes back. Yeah. Know? there and they were just awful to work for really unpleasant um, and I think I lasted about a year and a half maybe wow. and then I it kind of actually drove me to a bit of a nervous breakdown so I ended up taking a month off of work and then when I went back I handed in my notice but it took like another month of seeing out your notice and then I couldn't find a job for a while and eventually a, a friend of mine had been teaching in Poland and he came to stay with us in London and he said 
oh, well, you've got a degree in English. You'd probably make a really good English teacher. Why don't you try English teaching? So I thought about it and I was like, well, I guess I could give it a go. So I did my teacher training. Having never taught, I did teacher training in London and then started working for a little Japanese school in Ealing. Hmm. And then, yeah, that eventually led to me moving to Japan with the same company. Yeah. So we'll quickly gloss over that little unpleasant moment in my in my book career. <laughs> that's, uh, that's plenty. I mean, I just think it's so... I mean, I'm really sorry to hear that you had a bit of a nervous breakdown and took time off work, but way to go for taking what you needed, to taking mm. the time out what you needed and then quitting and then just following what presented itself to you next. Mm. You know? I also did get to spend the summer on my allotment <laughs> gardening. So that was quite therapeutic too. Where did you live in London yeah. at that time? I was just outside of Ealing in a yeah. little place called Perivale. Okay. And it's on the end of the central line. Okay. But we were like the last house before the woods. And there was be this like this wooded hill kind of going into Greenford. And we were the last house. So it, at night you'd be sitting there, you could hear the deer screaming, foxes barking. It was very um magic. Yeah, <laughs> mythical. It's uh, uh, yeah, magic, mythical, yeah. legendary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Huge water rats as well. Nice. <laughs> very wind in the willows. Mm. so you were at the little Japanese school and then did you ask them or did they invite you to go to Japan I think I must have asked because I think I decided after a while that you know actually I'm doing this in London but I could do this anywhere and I really got on with my Japanese students as well ah so um, you felt a kinship with them and yes yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, financially, of course, the highest salary was in Japan at the time. Exactly. And you know what? <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but that's why I came to Japan as well, because it was like, yeah. Spain, I really want to live in Spain. And then I was like, euros or euros, euros or, or yen? yen. Mm, euros mm. or yen. And that was, it was straightforward yen. Yeah. But what nobody tells you is that the cost of living in Japan is quite high. <laughs> so. Yes, it is quite high. And there's a lot to do. And Mm. There's a lot, there's plenty to do. There's plenty of places to take your money as well, isn't it? But when exactly. you, once you live here, you find ways to just have an ordinary life, don't you? Yeah, true. true. It's, I mean, it's extraordinary always, but yeah, mm. I mean, yeah. I don't kind of balk at my grocery shopping these days. No, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, England. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, go. so uh, moving on. So you so you moved to Japan. You moved to Japan with one of the yes. big, 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 big English language teaching schools, right? Yes. And that was quite interesting because I, you know, this big language school that had this school in London, the way things operated in London was completely different to how they operated in Japan. Yes. Um, so I get to Japan and this little Eikaira school in the mountains. And they're like, Oh, you can't teach like that. That's how I was taught to teach. And they're like, no, we use this method. Mm, no <laughs> so I kind of played along for a little bit and then I went off and was doing my own thing in class and everyone seemed quite happy yeah um, as long as you can just be like smile and nod and fulfill as yeah. many rules as you possibly can yeah but yeah I had specified when they offered me the job that was quite funny as well they, they three things they said you can you can have uh, for your request for somewhere to live so I said okay not Tokyo and not a big city preferably by the sea in Kyushu and I ended up in Nagano <laughs> in the mountains <laughs> so, in the mountains no nowhere near the sea and definitely not in Kyushu <laughs> basically I think I wanted to end up in Kagoshima um, oh I love Kagoshima but yeah, yeah. I never got there so mm. so yeah Obviously, that was the way for you to kind of make your make your money and so on. How did you start to kind of build a life around you? How did you start to create the lifestyle and the life that you wanted once you got to to Japan? Because you know, English teaching in an Aikaiwa is not really a lifestyle choice, is it? No, <laughs> I don't think I really got into living in Japan until I went freelance until that company went bankrupt um, because they moved me to Yokohama 
which is the second city here in Japan. It's a yes, it, I think it was also their biggest school in the country as well. Okay. And even then, it was difficult to meet people or do anything outside of work because of mm-hmm. the hours we were working. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until I went freelance and I started going places and meeting other people. And that's also when I moved to Tokyo and, you know, I moved to Asagaya. So I was much more in the thick of things. And um, Asagaya, and let's just, there. can you just paint a picture of Asagaya for us? Asagaya is about 10 to 15 minutes outside of Shinjuku on the Chua line. It's a very sort of, I guess, what we call Shitamachi. So it's a kind of downtown place. And by that, I mean, it's got quite a local vibe to it. It's also got a really good bar and music scene. There's lots of jazz bars and little little live houses. And I guess the focal point of Asagara at that time would have been uh, Gamuso. That, yeah, which um, was a foreign-run place, right? Yes. yes yeah. So, so they were putting on art shows and, and gigs. And I think the clientele there most of the time was sort of 50-50 uh Japanese and foreign yes uh, so it was quite an interesting mix of people yeah yeah lots yeah. and lots of different kind of alternative bands drag acts mm. art shows like you said yeah, yeah sadly no longer there yes but. it did close down that's right mm. yeah so so it's yeah. got that kind of vibe it, it's got like it, it suits you I think is what what I want to kind of paint a picture of like Asagaya, that whole train line, which has got like Nakano, Koenji, Asagaya, Ogikubo, Kichi Joji, mm-hmm. got this very kind of, I want to say artistic, but it's, it's more than no, that. It is though. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of writers and artists and musicians around. There. Yes. Um, yes. And I mean, I remember one of my friends I met sitting next to her in the bar there one night was like in a eighties pop band. <laughs> And we just got chatting, like, oh, hi. <laughs> and then I didn't realise for a very long time that she was very well known. Yeah. Um, also, weird fun fact, the, the house used in Ring, is it Ring or Juon? One of the big Japanese movies, I think it's Juon, was filmed in a house in Asagaya. So there you go, a little horror reference for you. Well, it keeps coming back, doesn't it? These golden threads <laughs> running through your story. So you went freelance and you've got all this stuff going on. So how did you start to kind of pull this community together around you? So it was 2010. I can't believe it's that long ago since that particular school went bankrupt. And then you had this, like, you had a really nice posse, a really nice crew of people here, didn't you, that you you hung mm. out with, all kind of similar values, all you know, got a slightly punk vibe about them. How how did you pull together all of that and get involved in Fuji Rock and everything? I think a lot of it is just chance meetings with people who you click with very quickly. Yeah. Okay, so the first magazine that I started working for, I got that job uh, because I had just recently upgraded from a film camera to a digital camera. This mm-hmm. was probably 2010, 2011. And I was on a Tokyo Bay booze cruise um, with a group of people. And one person on there saw me with my camera and and came up to me and said, oh, can I have a look at your photos? And weirdly, I found these photos on my Facebook the other day. But she said, I'm looking for a photographer for my magazine. I was like, oh, yeah, what kind of magazine is it? And she said, oh, it's a a rock magazine. I was like, hi. (laughs) (laughs) And then a week later, I was at this gig in the top of La Forêt. There were all these incredibly gorgeous band men all dressed up doing a fashion show. And then at the end of the fashion show, they put on a gig. And I was shooting it. And I don't think I had photographed a band since I was at university. So it was a good oh, 10 years. And then it carried on from there. So I was mostly shooting bands for this. And these were all visual K bands. So, you know, they're incredibly good looking, very visually delicious. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like 70s glam never went away. So it's like 70s glam with this sort of uh, punk aesthetic, I guess. Yeah, it was such fun to shoot. The music's not always to my taste, yes. put it that way. But visually, it was so much fun. It was a really good time. <laughs> and then I eventually, out of that, started a blog. So I was interviewing bands that I was meeting around, going to all these gigs and through all these various connections that I was making. 
So I was interviewing bands, photographing bands. Through that blog, I remember chasing a band, a heavy metal band from Osaka called Crossfaith, who are now a really huge deal, actually. They went on to become incredibly popular and very successful outside of Japan, which actually for a Japanese rock or heavy metal band is quite difficult. Yeah, quite unusual. Um, uh, yeah. In the, uh, uh, except outside like underground scenes or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I had been chasing them for an interview for about six months. And I was emailing their manager every time they came through Tokyo. I was like, can I have an interview? Can I have an interview? Can I have an interview? Hi, can I have an interview? And one day I'm getting ready to leave my school job. And he comes back to me at like three o'clock in the afternoon. He's like, yeah, can you be here at 4.30? I'm like, sure. (laughs) I remember flying off to, I think it was your Yogi Stadium. Mm -hmm. Well, No, it wasn't your Yogi Stadium. It's the live house that was there. Was it Shibuya Axe, the one that's been knocked down? Yeah. I can't remember now. Anyway, I turned up out of breath because it was warm as well. So I was a bit sweaty and horrible. I had my camera, my recorder. And I interviewed two members of the band. Then I went upstairs to the guest, the VIP section upstairs. And I was just sitting in the auditorium, like biding my time, waiting for this gig to start. And this uh, very tall foreign guy walks over to me and he's like, hey, what are you doing here? (laughs) Or like, well, in nicer terms than that. But he introduced himself and he said he was photographing the band that night. And he asked who I was working for. I was like, I'm not working for anyone. I'm working for myself tonight. And he said, oh, maybe you'd like to come and work for my magazine. So then he contacted the editor of what was then Smashing Mag. Mm -hmm. And they took me on. And so then I ended up writing live reviews and eventually shooting. I just kept, I don't think they wanted me as a photographer because they had plenty. But I just kept asking and eventually they gave in. And so I was at, ended up doing that for them for a few years. And then the first time I got offered the Fuji Rock job, I couldn't do it because I was in Spain that summer. Mm. And then the following year, I worked on the Fuji Rock Express as just a writer. And then the next year was offered the position sort of heading it and putting that wonderful schedule together where you have to schedule six writers over four days. I've seen this schedule. It's like these tiny little skinny post-it notes. Or Oh, that's I mean, my method, yes. Blew my mind. Forms. Yeah. Blew my mind. That Something thing that... used to take me like two days. It oh. took me two days in my kitchen with post-it notes. <laughs> I just like, you know, made me feel twitchy that. But it's absolutely amazing as well that you had that dedication <laughs> to do that and get it just right. So you have to move everything around, don't you? Mm. Something that strikes me here is uh, it's just your kind of self-confidence to just ask for things. Like you kept asking this band over and over again if you could work with them. And then the other thing is um, there's a there's a kind of career methodology kind of thing that's been labelled planned happenstance. So mm. it's that sense that you've got this readiness, so you're ready. You're a writer, you've got your camera, you've got your confidence, you've got your willingness to ask. And then things just happen. So that gentleman approached you and, you know, you're ready and you were able to say yes. And then that opened the doors to something else, uh, which opened the doors to something else, which eventually had you kind of heading up the team for the magazine for Fuji Rock. Fuji Rock, by the way, is the kind of, it's kind of like Reading or Reading Festival or Glastonbury Festival, something like that, but huge. It's massive. Yeah, it's the biggest the outdoor slope. festival in Japan. Yeah. And I think it's 30, 40,000 people over the weekend. Yeah. I went 10 years ago as a participant, as a, as just a, but I also worked on my friend's fish and chip store. <laughs> yeah, years. the fish and chip shop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the worst job in the world. <laughs> I think you might have served me fish and chips there. Once, I think I have actually. served you fish and chips. I mean, I, it, yeah. was, it was good fun, but it was hard work and disgusting. But I got to see mm. Bjork, which was nice. Yeah, that was a wonderful year, wasn't it? I, it was. I was reviewing her. I still think that's my favourite piece of music music writing I've ever done. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll have to seek that out. Oh, don't. <laughs> okay, I won't. So, um, so, that's, so where did you get this kind of... Like I call, I like it like strategic cheek to just keep asking and asking and asking and not get like, oh, I don't know at what point my attitude to this changed. But I think at some point I used to be quite 
terrified of asking people for things because yes. I didn't want to get, get rejected. But at some point, I think in terms of the photography and the music, I think I realised that like the worst they can say is no. Yeah. And if they say no, then I'll just move on. Although in some cases it didn't move on, I just carried on <laughs> asking nicely. Yeah, so I think, I don't even really know when that happened, but there was a change in attitude that occurred. Yeah, that kind of just made me slightly more tenacious about yeah. doing what I want to do. And I think, I also, I think I was enjoying it so much that was more motivating than anything else. And especially for you, the blog and things, you know, I wasn't getting paid for that. I was doing it all off of my own dime, as it were. So I think it was just the, the pure pleasure of doing it. And, you know, photographing some really huge bands and, and talking to people about music, which is one of my passions. And I think it was the first time I remember noticing a change in my attitude towards things. Mm. Uh, yeah. And what was the result of that then? It was just that you got to play a, a big game. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, you just get to play. If you don't ask because you're too ashamed or worried about what was going to happen or being rejected, then you just don't get to play, do you? I think one of the reasons I pursued that band so much is because I knew they were going to be big. And I knew that once they were big, I would not get access to them. Interesting. So I was like, I have to do it now because I want, I know that, you know, this time next year, it's not going to happen. Amazing. But I remember seeing that band uh, at that show and that was, they just, I think they'd just come back from doing like their first overseas show and they were really like pumped up and excited. And then I saw them in 2013, I think it was December, 2013. They'd just come back from their first European tour and they were absolutely on fire. They were, I've never seen a show like it before or since it was so good it gave me I even want to think about it now it gives me goosebumps and the, the that same photographer who was at that show he photographed that gig and he said that my report gave him goosebumps it was such a magic show yeah it was really impressive to see this band going from you know local success to international success beautiful mm. beautiful so I'd like to shift gears a little bit now and start mm. talking about your kind of CSR activities, uh, corporate mm. social responsibility activities, and also your connection to Peace Boat. So do you want to explain about Peace Boat a little bit and then tell us about your experience on that and what yeah. kind of life-changing experience that was? And then your introduction to FEW, the uh, Organisation for Empowering Women here. So and we, can, peace, we can move into yeah. the modern day then. And um, start <laughs> to land actually. the interview. <laughs> Peace Boat is a non-government organisation, I believe. I think I've got mm -hmm. that correct. It was started, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s, by a group of university students who wanted to travel to, I think, what must have been Korea, South Korea, to kind of foster some grassroots connections about the things that they were studying. Because I... If I remember this correctly, I think they realised that what they were studying was not quite the truth of things, especially as the relationship between South Korea and Japan and, well, and North Korea and other you know, Asian countries it can be a little bit fraught. Yeah, there's some of, historical of, stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I think their aim was to, you know, let's meet these people face to face and, you know, get this sort of grassroots conversation going between people rather than going through textbooks or whatever else yeah. and it's now become this huge cruise ship now which um goes <laughs> goes around the world two or three four times a year and they have the southern route and the northern route um so depending on which cruise you're on you'll either be hitting like the Maldives and Easter Island or you'll be going through northern Europe the Mediterranean further north and it's it is the most magical Organ I keep saying, I keep talking about magic a lot today. Oh, um, my friend. <laughs> this, is, this is basically where my life is lived. <laughs> Don't worry. It is the most magical experience. I, I've never had 80 days like it, and I ne probably never will ever again. It was so good. So I was on board teaching English. And I guess the interesting thing about the method on board is that it's all needs-based. So you, you negotiate that curriculum with your students. And then 
you don't really have much access in terms of to things like resources, you know, textbooks, photocopiers. It's all really straight out of your backpack stuff. But you you become quite resourceful. So, you know, we'd always have these speakers on board who would be coming in to do different things. So I'd just grab them and ask them to come to class. And then my students would interview them for an hour Mm -hmm. and just, you know, find out a bit more about their lives, about whatever topics they were talking about. Yeah. And then, of course, in addition to that, we're doing things on land. So, you know, you get into a port and some days you're doing an activity or other days, you know, you've got your free time. I was also (laughs) teaching yoga and uh, running rock nights. (laughs) Okay, so we haven't even talked about yoga yet. You're a qualified yoga teacher as well, aren't you? I'm an overachiever. (laughs) (laughs) I, I generally find that if I get, if I enjoy doing something, I like to do it to as far a degree as possible which is why I haven't started wine tasting classes yet because I'll end up being a sommelier (laughs) (laughs) and so something you know just and also I just wanted to kind of mention that that people do pay to go on the peace boat so people like Japanese people do actually pay as guests to go on a cruise right so they're actually they're on a cruise they're on a holiday but Mm. there's all this education and the idea is to create these kind of cultural conversations with people and learn from Mm. learn about stuff not from textbooks but by actually visiting all these different ports with the Mm. with the goal of creating more peace Mm. And the interesting thing, of course, is it's not really a traditional cruise in that the entertainment is mostly passenger generated. Yes. Everybody is bringing a skill that they have. So I, at the time, had the yoga Mm -hmm. um, and the collection of MP3s on my iPhone. (laughs) But other people were talking about their experiences doing certain things or were teaching a sport. There was lots of go and go being like Uh, chess kind of thing yes yes Yes. there was probably some mahjong as well just yes yes there were all sorts of things going on on board so what was your Um, big takeaway hmm. from that then I think I came off that ship feeling like I could do anything you know there was so much opportunity in meeting other people and learning from other people and I generally am quite a solitary uh most of the things I do are by myself (laughs) so the 80 days of you know not being able to get away from anybody you know I had a roommate who luckily actually slept most of the time (laughs) which was really good I had the place to myself but yeah so actually being in a in a a kind of quite pressure cookery environment I guess with all these people who are all having an amazing time and meeting people and having experiences and learning about things yeah it's quite empowering so talking about empowering then, so of course we experienced the earthquake in March 2011. Mm. And at that point, I was the president of a, an organization called Few for Empowering Women. And we invited an enormous range of MPOs to come and, and NGOs to come and speak for us on what they were doing in their disaster relief in the April following that. And Peace Boat was one of the people who had mobilized, gone up to Tolhoku to do what's called first response, because within a disaster that magnitude, there's different phases of response and first response is things like clean up and just hygiene and just all those things that need to happen immediately for people and so then we were impressed by Peace Boat and we invited them to be our social impact partner there. And then you came back and spoke for a few for Empowering Women, didn't you, with another mm. person called Panya Lincoln. And so you you were talking about Peace Boat and you were speaking very eloquently about it. And I think as a result, you got a mem- free membership and then you mm. ended up joining the board of directors at some point. Yes, yeah, I remember you contacting me. I think you called me up <laughs> and um, you said, oh, you know, I think you'd be really good for this position on the board. And I think at the time I was like, me? <laughs> really? Yeah, that's how um, I, I love that about things like this, though. I love this about few. It's like people are often like, me? Oh, all right mm. then. And then that's also quite empowering as far as I can say anyway. Mm. Yeah. I remember that meeting because I had my grey pinstripe suit on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the first and last time I wore that suit. You were having a go. I was trying. Are you in it, disguise. It 
<laughs> yeah. But yeah, joining the book, I mean, and Few was, was, was a great uh, place to be. I mean, just meeting all those different women doing all those different things was, was really great. And the monthly meetings, just a little bit of learning something new. Where was that place? Was it, was it in Aoyama? Where was it? Um, yeah, it was called first... the Wesley Centre, I think, wasn't it? Yes, it was in Hiro. Yeah. Hiro was that kind of triangular shaped room. So yes. Hiro is like quite an uh, upmarket area of Tokyo. But we had it in the, yeah, there was this really kind of open room. That was a good room, actually. It always felt cosy, but big enough. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think I, I, I had not really met many professional women before joining few so it was really nice to to meet all these people and, and and actually see you know what other people were doing and the potential things that you could be doing because I was still at that point you know teaching was still paying the rent yeah but then it kind of really started getting me thinking about well you know there's other things I could possibly try and I remember I mean the CSR job my so my position was corporate social responsibility yes. and I do remember having this very um <laughs> grueling job of going through that list of all of those NGOs and NPOs that had set up and checking who was still in action <gasps> yeah a few years later yeah and uh, so many of them had sort of disappeared yeah they'd kind of popped up done their job and then and then finished and then there was, uh, you know, talking to all the other potential partners that we could have worked with, like Lighthouse. That was the trafficking. trafficking yeah. Yes. The, against um, trafficking women. Yeah. And there was Tell. Um, yeah, Tokyo English Lifeline for the um, yeah. mental health. Yeah. Yeah. And who else did we work with? I don't recall offhand. Yeah. But yeah. So many good. Um, oh, Mirai no Mori. Oh, oh yes. yes. Yeah, I've got a very strong connection with them. Now they work with orphans. Yeah. Not orphans, children in care homes. What am I talking about? Some people are orphans, but most it's yes. only 20 or 30%, I think. Actually, mm. most people are being looked after in care because of difficulties in the family, mm. ranges of difficulties. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Amazing. So I kind of feel like we can start to move into kind of closing out now. CSS. Career yes, strategy yes. seminar. So obviously you kept in touch with few and mm. you know, perhaps continue to go. And then you had got to a kind of you'd got to a kind of critical point, I think, where you were kind of ready to leave, but also were there was something going on, wasn't there, where you wanted to do something. And yeah, yeah. So I joined, had go on. I had kind of realized that my career was not going anywhere at least my teaching career I think had gone as far as it could possibly have gone um, you know at that point I was teaching at university and in order for me to get a, a sort of full-time or, or tenured position I would have needed to go and get a, an, a another MA because <laughs> the, the teaching qualification I have is equivalent to an MA but it just doesn't say a master's degree on it something needs to change something's waiting like, to happen yeah, my lifestyle can't continue on like this anymore. And I was trying to write. I was writing because for a long time I hadn't been able to write for a few years because I'd been quite depressed, you know. But then I'd come out the other side of that and the writing was back on track. And I was like, I need to do something. So it was more about trying to find some balance. And then I had all these stupid ideas like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go do a master's in education because I want to carry on teaching. And then I went to see you at this career strategy seminar. In my capacity with, as coach for 20 minutes, yes. I think, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Like speed no, coaching. Like so I have to be very, very direct in those situations, right? Yes. Yeah. But it was, it was really good because I turned up with like, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that and blah, blah, blah. And you just were extremely good at like cutting through all of that bullshit audience Sarah was basically saying <laughs> she's like this lights you up talking about that doesn't why don't you do this I and think it was first... more reverse more like why are you talking about doing that mm. and you were like mm. oh. <laughs> I think I was talking about wanting to do that because that's what felt like other or linguistics or something yeah oh yeah. it was the should yeah. it was the should version the should option yes so I was very much toying with the idea of this is what I should do and this is actually what I want to do. And luckily, I chose the path of what I want to do <laughs> instead. And so we put together this plan. And I think it was like a three-year plan, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think a um, yeah, three to five-year plan. I always get people to plan on that kind of timeline just yes. so they can see the spaciousness of op opportunity. Yes. 
Yeah. And then I remember coming away from that and I was on the train to work the following morning and I made a list of all the things that each of those would like each of those things would involve and this is based on Catherine North's queen sweep right yeah where she tells you to like assign an actual proper verb not just do something but like collate organize send you know like very specific action verbs yeah and so I made this whole like little list of all these little sub actions that had to happen in order for those things to take place and then I just kind of started checking them off bit by bit and then I ended up actually that three-year plan was accomplished in two years so what was that then well the first part was to get out of Japan because that was the hardest thing to do wasn't it yeah so it was a case of finding where I was going to go next which was Um, uh, I ended up in Spain but Bali in between (laughs) no Oh yeah, so I went to Bali in between. That wasn't in the original plan, but it's it was a it was a nice detour. Yeah, yeah. And was that two hundred or three hundred hours you did there? Yoga. Two hundred. Two hundred. Uh, yeah, yoga hours. Yeah. yeah. So you're training. I'm just trying to remember. I think it was two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So I I had been doing yoga for years, and it was one of those sort of bucket list things I wanted to do. Where it's yeah. like I want to go and train to be a yoga teacher, and. It was probably actually the worst time to train to be a yoga teacher because I was exhausted emotionally and physically from from leaving Japan. I was definitely not in the best place to be around a bunch of strangers doing something quite intense for a month. In Um, Lycra. (laughs) In Lycra. And also I was by far the biggest person there. I was like, I was a big yogi. So, you know, there were things that I had been able to do in the past and being sick had caused me to put on quite a lot of weight. So there are things I had been able to do in the past as a yogini that I was no longer able to do. But what I really did enjoy doing was uh, watching other people do them. (laughs) It was like, awesome, you can do crow pose. Yay. I have been doing yoga for like 20 plus years. I still can't do a crow pose and I probably never will. And it's fine. Yeah. And Um, that's what yoga is all about yes it's not a checklist Um, exactly and it kind of made me realize actually I really enjoy doing this but I don't enjoy the competitive element of it that creeps in sometimes yeah like you don't have to get yourself into the most contorted positions possible to be to be doing yoga you know like sometimes you can just sit on the floor (laughs) and that's fine the more bolsters the better yeah, so that was great. Again, one of those things in hindsight, I could probably have waited a little longer to do. But still, it was a good transition, yeah. I suppose, out of Japan over to Bali and then on to mm. Spain, right? Yeah, I mean, J- Bali is like the most magical place on earth. I love it. It's one of my favorite places, and I would gladly go back anytime. <laughs> and yeah, and then I ended up in Spain teaching just as an interim thing because there was some uncertainty. <laughs> Uh, with the university I was applying to as to whether or not I was a British student. So British students and EU students at the time had much lower fees than international students. And I, of course, could not have afforded to be international, despite the fact that I have a passport and an accent, (laughs) which uh, would suggest that I am quite British. Yeah. So anyway, I went there. That was actually a terrible teaching experience on the whole. Some of my students were wonderful. Most of them were not. But I did make some wonderful friends. And I lived by I lived by the lived beach. By the, I, I loved that because we both moved to the beach at the yes. same time. So we were like comparing our beach <laughs> photographs. And I just loved that so much. I used to go and walk on the beach every morning, unless, of course, there was a storm or something. Yeah. But I'd be on the beach every morning, walking up and down. It was, it was great. Bucket list again. And then, of course, halfway through that, COVID hit. So... I was stuck in my house for seven weeks by myself for that first period of COVID. That was like March 2020. Yes. Yeah. So I remember having my interview for the MA during that time. So actually, I'd already done my application at that point, And I'd spent the few months before that writing and sort of preparing something. And then I had my interview during that time. And I, I remember the person who interviewed me. I sort of explained that I had left Japan with the intention of doing this course and I was currently in Spain and they they said to me so have you applied anywhere else like nope (laughs) but again it's one of those things where 
uh, and it comes back to what you were saying about chasing after things that Mm -hmm. you know that are, are heading in the right direction I don't think at any point I considered that it might not happen. Yeah. <laughs> and it was only in the last few weeks when I was kind of waiting to hear if I'd got this scholarship. Where I was just like, what the fuck have you done? <laughs> like, That's quite normal. You have, you have given up everything to come and do this. And there's this horrible possibility that it's not going to happen. What have you done? Bravo yeah. you for not letting that derail you though. I mean, because some people would derail at that point, but it's also not unusual for people to do that. I mean, you're not the only person who I've taken through to a Masters of Literature. Mm. And like they got it and everything. We were like, yay. And then the next coaching session, they're like, what the fuck have I done? Who do I think I am? And then, mm. you know, of course, that was no surprise to me who listens to people all day, every day, but like it's also like, oh no. <laughs> yeah don't, don't not do it <laughs> yeah I just so love seeing people thriving in something that they love in a in an academic setting as well or whatever it is but yeah is yours a master's of literature oh it's creative writing right yes yours? yes yes yeah 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 so um, you got in you got a scholarship and then I came back to England in the middle of COVID yeah <laughs> <laughs> so do you um, actually so you live in Norwich now is that right I do yes yes yeah I live here and I've been here for nearly a year and a half now and I was teaching part-time at the city college but then again students amazing everything else rubbish so I quit I was just like yeah. okay I'm done probably should have had a better plan than let's te- quit teaching and then find out what happens um <laughs> but I'm in the process of it I work at a theatre in town I'm just pulling pints and making coffee part-time right. and that's fine yeah it's nice work people I work with are nice I get to go to the theatre sometimes and Norwich is a great place it's very artistic there's lots of people here lots of writers lots of people a little off the beaten path who are doing things a little off the beaten path I think so it's a nice place to be and it's small it's so different from Tokyo like there's a horizon (laughs) so it's it's weird sometimes like I look back at all of that time I spent in Tokyo and in Japan, and I'm just like, who was that person? What was it doing? Like, that life is so different to the one I have now. I sometimes look back and I'm like, it's no wonder, it's no wonder you're so tired. <laughs> you know, I was doing so much, and I had so, you know, such a good network of people, these wonderful people that I knew. Yeah, then to kind of come back and have to kind of set up all over again. You forget how long it takes to form those connections. Okay, yeah. I mean, I haven't done that for for a long time. So, Mm. yeah, I can imagine making friends. (laughs) Uh, Making friends when you're, you know, when you're in your early 40s is quite hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different kettle Um, of fish, isn't it? I mean, luckily, you know, being, being on this course, I've made some really good friends and... Norwich is a quite gregarious place. There's plenty of people to meet. But I mean, again, the whole COVID situation has made it much more difficult because people don't tend to mingle in the same way they used to. And I think I also personally am just a bit like, everybody, two metres, please. (laughs) But yeah, I think things will improve. And most importantly, though, the studying is going well. The writing is going well. And I've almost got my photography back up and running again. Yes, so. I've seen some of your latest f- photographs. So you set up a studio and a little studio at home and stuff. Is that right? Yeah. So I can set up all of my my camera, my my studio stuff in our living room in the house I'm living in. Mm. I have a very tolerant landlady. So. How nice. Um. <laughs> and and so I want to hear about the course. You said you know writing's going well, studying's going well. It was very kind of modest way of putting it but are you enjoying it like was it like like how is it how is it being on a creative writing course I'm quite jealous in a way (laughs) um I would say it's totally worth the sacrifice that I made for for it it is so nice to be doing what you love all the time and forefronting it beyond other things you know like I I get to say hey I'm not doing that job because this comes first or I'm not doing that because this comes first and you know most of the time before I was doing this I was often having to make time to write right whereas now I feel like I'm just making time to do other things rather than writing are you a writer now then 
I guess so. It's on my Instagram profile. I guess so. <laughs> I'm not having that. Coach is not having that. <laughs> Yes, I'm a writer now. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I've I've been a writer for a long time, but I yes. think yes, I would be more comfortable giving myself that title now than I used to be. Can we um, expect to see anything from you published? Mm, that's not that's a high pressure question, but I'm just yes. wondering because um my friend Caroline's about to publish her poetry yes. book, Cow. Yes. Yeah. I remember you talking to me about that. I don't have anything definitely coming out any time soon, put it like yes. that, but there are certainly things in progress. Yeah, irons in the fire. <laughs> could potentially become something. Um, yes, but, you know, I'm quite uh, apparently quite determined, so maybe we'll make this happen. Well, from the sounds <laughs> of this, well, listening to the, the, this conversation, absolutely. I mean, I'm learning all kinds of things about you that I didn't, you know I didn't know so it's, mm. uh, it's really interesting <laughs> and it's uh, like I feel so relaxed and kind of warm inside hearing imagining you there in Norwich kind of it's almost like I don't I can't think what film it is but some kind of movie where people are at Oxford or Cambridge and they're just writing away in their room <laughs> it's the kind of image I have of you at the moment yeah, I'm mostly writing in coffee shops <laughs> mostly writing in coffee shops yeah. cool no, it's weird, isn't it? So when you started talking to me earlier, before we started recording, you were talking about how I look a bit more glowy. You and you're not well. the first person, you're not the first person to say this. I've had this actually from my mum and uh, a friend in New Zealand who've, who've all said, you look very different. And I think when everybody last saw me, well, you guys all saw me in, in Tokyo, I was really uh, suffering, I think. You were not well. Um, yeah, you no. were suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And I think being able to do the thing that you love and really focus on it has such a huge impact on your well being in other ways. Yeah. I mean, also, I, you would not believe how little alcohol I drink now. I've left Japan. <laughs> it's, it's such, such an a, alcoholic place. Oh, it's my such God. Such a boozy culture. 20, yeah. 24 7, you're never like more than mm. 100 meters from somewhere you can purchase a whole range of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, that probably helps. But, yeah, I think more than anything, it's just being able to pursue the things that you, you want to do to a level, you know, amongst people who are as good, if not better than you as well. Um, and that, that whole feedback process is like everybody is improving and getting better every time they're submitting something. So it's really very juicy place to be I think juicy, <laughs> you know love it. <laughs> so Laura where can people find you online do you want to share your Instagram or your blog or something I don't have a blog at the moment okay um, good to know you're because you're doing the real thing <laughs> other things to do yeah um so my Instagram is rock and Laura photo so rock. that's rock and mm. as in rock and roll yes but rock and Laura photo Laura that name actually came out of the play on words with rock and rora. Yeah, because like your name in Japanese, Japanese is yeah. Japanese is rora, right? Or it can yeah, be yeah, read yeah. that way. Yeah. Yes. Rora. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rock and roller, rock and laura. On Twitter, I am, I think, Black Lily101. And that's Lily with two L's. So yes. if anybody wants a headshot or anything else, www.rockandlaurafoto.com. We'll be sure to link to those in the show notes as well. Lock and Laura photo.com. Thanks, Laura. So my final question that I ask everybody is there are many ways to lead a life. And what does that mean to you? Mm. I think for me, it's a, all about being able to uh, reiterate on things and noticing, as we've mentioned, noticing the threads that, that run through mm. and being aware of them and following them because very often these at least for me these things have started early and where I haven't been observing them things have gone a bit awry but where I'm back on that track things are much better <laughs> you know <laughs> much better um, much better yeah yes yeah it's a case of like seeing what works and changing it if it doesn't and then try this out and, and you know adjust this here and there and there sometimes those you come to the end of that thread Ooh. like with teaching you know was wonderful for many many years 
and I was, you know, fully committed to, to being a teacher until I wasn't. Yeah. And then that's, that's, that's fine. So sometimes, yeah, you that. know. So interesting, like following the threads. And if you don't follow them, things go awry. I, and mm. I, on the flip side of that, I have to say that when we had that convers that very like laser coaching 20 minute session, can't think of anybody else who had such a strong reaction to that where you were like, like where, where I was like option A, the thing you don't doesn't light you up or option B, the thing that lights you up. Your face was like, what? <laughs> it was magic. <laughs> it was pure magic. that and, 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 you know, and then you get that momentum from obviously then you have to come up into the consensus reality and do the stuff in the real world that needs to be done. You made your list, etc. Mm. So but that moment. I will never forget it. I was so delighted uh, to, to, I, I mean, I'm, I coach, I don't care if those moments do or don't happen, but when something like that does happen and it just kind of clicks, it just, mm. it's very satisfying. It's very, very satisfying. And now seeing you doing your masters in creative writing is just, it's such a joy to me. It really, it's, it's so joy. It's satisfying, but it's also, it's magical and it's such a joy. And I feel it just, it's so nice to see people do this because of course I'm a human being as well, who has their golden threads and who things go awry from time to time. So part of the reason why I do this is for my own satisfaction as well. To mm. be like, yeah, all right. Basically all I want to do at the moment is drink cups of tea and look out the window at the flowers. So sounds fab. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. It's been an absolute treasure, an absolute joy. And I'm sure there's loads and loads of great little takeaways that the listeners can take from here. I'm Sarah Faruya, and this is the Legends Podcast. I believe there are many ways to lead a life and everybody has stories. And I hope you enjoyed listening to this terrific story from Laura, from Rock and Laura Photo. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.